2007. Um, Martin, uh, along with many of his achievements, has been a passionate advocate for the quality in our product, particularly in terms of service and, of course, in our marketing. Thanks very much, Martin. Now, these sentiments align perfectly where, to where Tourism Australia really sees the future. Driven by the Tourism 2020 plan, we are pursuing a yield strategy that encourages us to find the consumers and the markets that will deliver the greatest benefit to this country. It means that we lead with our best when marketing in Australia. Now, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but what I would like to do is just look at the last 12 months and a little bit about the momentum that has been gained. Now, it has been a year where Tourism Australia has deliberately and significantly accelerated its strategies to pursue growth in Asia, an approach which I believe has profound and far-reaching consequences for the entire industry. While acknowledging the real need to care for our traditional markets, we have directed more of our focus and created more partnerships with neighbours in Asia, and particularly in China, and I also think with considerable success. As you all know, the industry was severely challenged by the free falling visitors after the GFC, particularly from Europe, the UK, USA and Japan. But at about the same time, I believe very luckily for all of us in this room, industrial growth in Asia was creating, creating a new middle class with the means and the desire to travel. Now, taking advantage of this transition from far-flung Western markets to near neighbours in the East has been central, I really mean central, to our strategies and also the strategies of our state and our territory partners. But as the Minister just said, we have not stopped marketing to the West. We are running a strong partnership model to ensure we are outspending competitive destinations in countries such as the UK, Germany, the USA and in Canada. And we have seen Europe and the USA and Japan growing again, which is very good news. Now this is going to be a short speech, so I will summarise some of the key themes and messages we have been focused on over the past, well, the past 12 months. Then we're going to be joined, as Colin said, and have a discussion on general things. But, as I said earlier, we are an industry that is really in transition. In the year 2000, less than 40% of our international business came from Asia, and now that number is more than 50%. And if you include the numbers from our friends in New Zealand, the Asia-Pacific region is already over 60% of Australia's inbound business. So obviously it is Asia from where the growth will come. Recent research shows that we are the number one preferred destination for Chinese consumers and then the top most considered destinations in countries such as India, Malaysia, Singapore, Korea and Japan. So we will continue to capitalise on the desire for Australia by our near neighbours. But I should say the shift from west to east is not the only transition our industry is now required to come to grips with, and particularly tourism in Australia. There is also a seismic shift from marketing through traditional media to digital and social media platforms. And while tourism in Australia has grasped this change, and I believe innovated very quickly, is my strong view that the entire industry's ability to capitalise on this shift will be vital to its huge success. Which leads me to the concept of one voice, which Martin mentioned. Many of you have heard, obviously, Andrew and I speak about this as well over the last 12 months. What is it about? It's about lining up behind Brand Australia to tell a consistent story, one that has impact. We can no longer afford in such a competitive environment to have a confused or disparate story message when telling our story overseas. Tourism Australia is a well-resourced national tourism organisation, but we can tell a much more powerful and a much more consistent story if we align our efforts with those of the states and territories and others in the industry, such as airlines, global distribution players, etc. 
Now it is as simple as branding our great destinations more clearly. For example, can we rely on Australia, the Great Barrier Reef, Australia, the Kimberleys, Australia? But it can be as complex or as detailed as lining up our marketing up behind is nothing like Australia. Better coordinating international roadshows and delegations and making a big, diverse country as simple and as appealing as possible to the target audience. There has been much work done in this space and our cooperative efforts are, I believe, being enthusiastically embraced and they are also growing very rapidly. Now the final theme I'd like to touch on is the constant investment, the need for constant investment and indeed reinvestment in the Australian tourism experience. Now, unlike some commentators, I happen to believe in the quality of the Australian tourism product and certainly in the, in the service that goes with it. And as someone who has travelled many, many times overseas, it is my personal view that the Australian visitor experience still stacks up against competitors and consumers leaving the country, as measured by Tourism Research Australia, agree with me. We get very good marks from people after they've been here. Yeah. That said, we can never afford to rest on past glories or the historic view of our country. The Tourism 2020 goals outlined the need for many additional beds in capital city Australia and not new beds for more volume, just better beds in regional Australia. And this is why Tourism Australia, along with the Department and also along with Australia, are seeking out investors who are willing to back the Australian <coughs> experience. Now, while it is early days in this partnership, the reaction from the international investor community has been enthusiastic, and Australia's fundamentals also hold strong appeal which returns in the hotel sector between 13 and 16 per cent over the past three years. So finally, I would like to encourage you to get behind Tourism Australia and the Australian tourism industry. Talk it up, not down. Find the opportunity, not just the problem. For our part, we will continue to lead with our best and work actively with partners to speak as effectively and as often as we can to a well-defined a well-defined target audience. This is the thinking behind our latest marketing campaign. Launched in 2010, the advertising has taken the image of Australia unashamedly up market. It is going extremely well in more than 20 countries. And it is a, a campaign that people want to work with. We have a dozen airline agreements that are backing the campaign. Now I really believe that Australia tourism is on the way up, that our near neighbours in Asia represent a once in a generation opportunity for continued growth and for continued prosperity, and that success will come down to our ability to deliver high quality visit experiences that back up the message we're putting out there, and that is the world's best in Australia. Thank you very much, and I think we're going to do it. Thanks very much, Jim. Anyway, we'll press on. I've got a fairly good volume to my, oh, that sounds like we're there. Jeff, you're very bullish on growth. The Minister was as well. You're also talking about it being an industry in transition. Now, you know, that can be a scary prospect for some people, but what you're saying is it's an enormous opportunity. I think it's You go. Is that on? I think so. No. How are we going with our sound down the back? Sorry, Jeff. <laughs> so much for the relaxed conversation at the car. No, no, no. <laughs> um, yeah, it might work. Are you speak? Am I working? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm really angry now. <laughs> <laughs> it's working all right. Maybe just speak at the lectern. Yeah. Okay. Oh, there we go. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right now, we have the dog. Yeah. Right. So, you've got the question. Um, I think, you know, a lot of people in this room might think, well, transition can sound scary. But is it an opportunity, that sense to be what you're saying? Well, of course it is an opportunity. And I think Australia's been at this a lot longer than others. I mean, one of them, just on China alone, um, we were one of the first three countries to have approved destination uh, status 10 years ago. Now there's 140. 
So we really have been at it. I think we've done a very, very good job, particularly in recent years. And uh, yeah, it's a uh, you know, it's a big opportunity, but I don't think people should be scared about it. And, and as the minister said, and I think we all say, we're still going to stick with the other markets as well. Yes, yeah, so you're going to obviously still go up to the traditional market. Andrew, if I can bring you in here. I mean, can we get down to a few tin tacks here? There is a perception, perhaps in this room, but certainly outside, in, you know, I'm in the media, I'm not in the tourism industry, that perhaps the Asian tourist, the Asian visitor, is an amorphous group, that they'll only come in big groups, they travel on buses, they don't spend a lot of money, and they follow someone with a flag. Is that a correct perception or completely false? It's definitely not the correct perception. I think you're going to hear from Sue Moon, who's uh, based in Singapore and is a great expert on Asia, but I think Sue would back me up in saying that it's a very disparate group of people and they're a high-yielding group of people. If you just take China as one example, 600,000 people from China will come to our country this year. A bit over 100,000 will come as group travellers on the Improved Destination Status Scheme. Another 130,000 or so will come as students they will bring friends and relatives. 70,000 will come as business people, and over 250,000 will come as visiting friends and relatives or pure leisure travellers who are having a holiday like you and I. So just to you know, carve them out as a cheap and cheerful, profitless volume group traveller is completely wrong, and, and it's the wrong way to go in thinking about it. So I'm going to be rude because I'm a pesky journalist to get down to tin tax. Are they rich? Will they spend a lot of money? Is that the sort of tourist, that, is that the sort of visitor you're targeting? When you look at this expenditure by country, and China is one of the top spending countries in the world, Singaporeans are great spenders, Malaysians, Indonesians, these are, these are wealthy people, uh, technologically savvy people with a big outlook on the world who want to see the world, and Australia is part of life's resume. So these are people like you and I who are, have emerged as well as people or are, are emerging. I think there is a little bit of ostentation out of places like China as they're coming into money, they want to demonstrate their wealth with you. So brands are really important, but also things like travel brands, and Australia is a great travel brand, are very important. Jeff, would you reiterate that? I mean, we're talking about, you know, they, they have money, they will spend here. No, there's no doubt about that. And uh, I think as James Taker said yesterday, they're going to have a middle class the same size as the total population of the United States. And um, they are exactly already... Exactly. Yeah, well, it's staggering. But everything about China is staggering, and that's why I think, uh, not, I think that's why we have gone very, very aggressively after this market. But we shouldn't forget India, we shouldn't forget Indonesia, um, Korea, they're just great markets, Japan's coming back. I mean, the truth is, these are our many neighbours. Uh, we've got a little bit bigger advantage, uh, that they're closer to us, the time zone is compatible. But I don't think we can um, uh, take anything for granted. As a matter of fact, Beijing is further away from Melbourne than it is from Paris, by the time. So it's not like we're just uh, they're going to walk over because it's close. It's not. And are we still competing in places like Paris, which we all know are fantastic tourists? Well, in, uh, in, in China, when uh, they ask where, where the most desired destination at the moment, as I said, but it's always one, two, and three, the United States, France, Australia. Wow. So it's going to be bad. I said it's Europe, you know, and Europe, again, is picking on China, but just right, it's about Indonesia, India, Malaysia, there's such growth over time, and Vietnam, these places, Latin America is growing, Australia are interested. There's so much opportunity, um, and as just said, one stop, non stop, same time, but, but, but when you talk to People who sell travel in China, they say the consumer thinks about Europe as luxury and tradition. They think about the US as popular culture, Hollywood, uh, wealth. And Australia, it's about our environment. It's our big skies, our fresh air, our welcoming people, but with great cosmopolitan cities as a jumping off point to those great experiences. Well, Jeff, you've just been recently on the trip to India with the Prime Minister. What sort of feedback did you get there? Because we've had a conversation about this, and it's fascinating what they told you about both their perceptions of Australia and what they want from Australia. Well, I spoke to a lot of people, and it was just not on tourism, just generally. And I was surprised myself, and I've lived in India and I've alive. Um, and um, they were just so enthusiastic about Australia, and given the problems we had about two or three years ago, I think that was terrific. Interestingly, I think Master Chef must be uh, 
the, the major program over there. And what they all kept saying, and we're seeing from our own people over there, is that they're surprised at just the quality of what they find in Australia. And the really good things they didn't realise, and I got a lot of this initially from Master Chef, but it's reinforced when they arrive that we're such a multicultural country. And I think that's what surprises a lot of people in Asia when they come to Australia and find out now, this is not so ang some Anglo outpost. This is a very, very vibrant multicultural country, and I think that's going to be one of our great advantages as we go forward. So, how can they respond to that? They, they want to, what well, we've got in terms of our natural beauty, our urban sophistication, but they actually want to know that we're multicultural, welcoming, and we, we have great food. Look, despite, I think despite that, that, those issues that happened in Australia and the Indians a couple of years ago, the best thing Australia's got going for it is people. Really, they are so welcome, so pleasant, and that's what we get all the time. Hey, Alan, we've done a bit of research in the 11 key markets we service, including uh, Asia and Europe and the Americas, and it really does show that there's absolutely strong perceptions of our world-class natural beauty, no doubt. Um, the food and wine bit is not perceived as highly, but when people come, they rate it as one of the number one food and wine destinations they've been to. And the people always stand out, the welcoming nature, the safe nature of our country. So sometimes I think we do talk ourselves down, a bit, we over worry some of this stuff. But in this research, which is now available at this conference, um, seeing is believing with these consumers. They sometimes come with not quite a strong perception from these things, but go away with a really strong uh, perception, which is a huge opportunity in terms of advocacy. So that's what your research is now bearing out. Can you also define that an Indian tourist, for instance, wants something different to a Malaysian tourist or a Taiwanese tourist? Just take food, for example. Um, a lot of Indian travellers are vegetarian. So just the ability to offer great, high quality, fresh produce, vegetarian mm -hmm. food, it's not that hard. We do it all the time. Um, is really important. We've all heard of the congee on the breakfast menu for the Chinese, halal food. Just our food offering in what is a great multicultural country could be one of the great advantages of this country from a tourism point of view. Jeff and I met a travel agent in China who said um, people say that you know food for the Chinese consumer is a matter of life and death. He said it's far more important than that. So it's the other one. But like, I think we, we have an asset there that we're probably not making enough of. Um, and the research really delves into what are their perceptions before they come? What are their perceptions where they leave? And where are we missing the boat? And one of them will be in that food element. Jeff, do you think it's important for us to try and, and this was part of the Asian Century paper, of course, to speak their languages? Or can we rely on all speak English? I don't think we can rely on all speaking English, but the truth is just many of them do. Uh, and, I, and I think the uh, objectives in the uh, white paper are lauded, there's no doubt. But I read a very interesting article in one of the newspapers in the last uh, 48 hours is saying it's all easy to say that, but when you come from an Anglo, Anglo background, it's exceedingly difficult for people to learn these languages. So, and this was from a linguist, and it was a very good article. And it said, this is going to be a very difficult uh, uh, thing for Australia to achieve. It doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Yeah, so it's something we have to grapple with, but perhaps the operators, they have to at least think about offering a service if they're going to target well, I think they're doing that. I think from uh, right around this country now, people have it. Um, in some areas, come a little bit slower than others, but they're really out there now saying, look, we've got to uh, look after these people. We've got to have Mandarin speakers. But, uh, I think I read the other day, and I've had spoken to people up in uh, North Queensland, the Tropic of North Queensland, the South Africa, North Queensland, uh, that uh, they have five or six uh, Guide markets who speak Mandarin. Really? And one of the things I think people have realised that uh, the Chinese are very, very people who like to get around. They're not going to want to be too many buses and that. They really are adventurous. And, uh, and I think that's a lot of the other Asian people. I don't think we should have stereotypes that everybody just wants to be in a bus with a flag. Yeah. That's no longer the case of the five people was it? The, um, one of the interesting issues that has come up is obviously the visa program and, and what the Minister was announcing. And just briefly, how important will that be? Oh, that's amazing. That's a great announcement. I'm sure we hear from the 
the Minister of Immigration later on more about it, but you know, e-visas for China is a great breakthrough. I hear a lot of people debate this, I meet when I go over to the immigration officials. Australia's visa system now is very good and it does deliver our visitors pretty well, but can we get better? And I think we always can, and it is a competitive advantage. Um, you know, making life easier for any traveller is always a competitive advantage. So that's an incredible announcement, um, and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, Mr. Bowen a bit later on. Jeff, how important do you think is it for us to remember that Australia might be, probably will be, first touch point for many people in Asia of the West. Well, it's important to remember, and uh, when we were in Indonesia recently, um, talking to some very high level officials and business people there, they were saying one of the, our, our attractions is it is our first touch point for the West, it's the closest part of the West, and that is important to me, there's no doubt. I mean, uh, for many reasons, I suppose there's a desire within Asia for much of what uh, Western culture represents. And I think Australia, over many years, has got itself in a position where it represents um, its own culture. It's got a fair bit of what I would say American, Anglo. It's a very interesting place. And I think the more people come here, the more they'll see it's interesting. And Xander, I think, mentioned, I mentioned earlier, the, the when people leave the country, they are very, very positive about it. Right? I think that's really, very good. And can I stagger to read in some of the briefing materials about how much money young people spend? Now, this global youth initiative, yes. it's obviously huge. They're not just poor backpackers who spend two dollars on a year. Of the six million people who come to our country, a quarter of them are under the age of 30. They're not all working holiday visas, but I think there was 185,000 working holiday visas. <laughs> 417 was issued last year. They're staying at least a year, sometimes two. They're working and traveling our country. On average, they're spending 13 and a half grand. Um, but to the Minister's point earlier, they're also filling some much needed jobs, particularly in uh, regional Australia. So it's a huge thing. We're going to have a real crack at trying to up the ante on that market over time. All right, and just briefly, business events, how's that going? Because yeah, it's, huge. it's been um, one of the great growth sectors the last couple of years it's really bounced back. It's huge in Asia, corporate meetings, incentives, some of the exhibition stuff. Um, it's worth more than 12 billion of that 95 billion dollars. Um, just under a million business event delegates coming and growing. And our traditional markets of the US growing and Europe as well. So that's a high yielding segment. And as Jeff said in his set piece, you know, we have a yield strategy. So these people who stay a long time and spend a lot of money, People like Chinese business spending more than 7,000 per head. This is event people spending four times what a leisure visit. These are really important segments for Australia. Just to sum up, I mean, Jeff, this change is real and it's happening. And I also noted that you and the Minister really had a very strong message for the industry to, you know, maybe talk yourselves up. Well, I think that's important. As I said, it's very, very good. We might be a, a mass long uh, a destination for tourists. I mean, the, the truth is we'll never get the numbers which uh, some people said yesterday, 15 million and things like that. We can't. And all of it will still be leading into long haul. Uh, we are still attracting people that to come six, eight hours. But yeah, we should talk the place up. The place is in very, very good shape. Many things can be done better. We can, we can get many other things to deal with, but really, we're not in bad shape. All right, and Andrew, it's not going to just land in our lap, is it? We do have to work for it. We do. And Jeff made a great point about this transition from traditional mediums, for example, to the digital space. And I think in our sector, the travel and tourism sector, where the consumer is bringing into them what they want, we have such an opportunity. Because if you put the words travel and Australia into search engines, they're pretty compelling words. People want them. So that our ability to be clever um, spend our money well, be strong or stronger than anyone else in the digital and social media space. I think will help set us apart into the future. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have to wrap this session up. Please thank Andrew and Jeff.